Good morning. How's everybody feeling today? Awesome. So am I. Thanks for asking. All right. So I know I say it every day, every time we get together on Sundays too. But today is a very special day. It's a day we weren't promised. It was a, it's a day we weren't guaranteed. But it's a day we get to worship our king together as a family. That is awesome. So if you guys would stand up with me. While you're in the motion of standing, I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful morning. Thank you for bringing us together again to worship your name. And Lord, as always, when I pray to you, I want you to know how much we love you. We adore you. And everything that we are and who we are and what we do is the hope that we would reflect who you are in our lives. And change us just a little bit more today. Because you are alive. You are working. And we want to worship your name. In his name we pray. Amen.
Hallelujah. Oh, he's good. Hey, let's worship him today. You guys ready? Let me hear some clapping. Thank you, Father. We worship you. Before we go into this third song, I want you guys to hear this Bible verse, and I want you to consider, I just want you to consider the journey that we take. Just listen to the words that describe who we are and how we grow and how we become who we become in Christ. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You're already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Remain in me, and I in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, but must remain in the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, 
you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he's thrown away like a branch and dries up. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they're burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. These things I have spoken to you, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. to do ooze with me. I want to hear your voices. That's why I'm cutting out these instruments except for the piano and the drums. Here we go.
walls. Check your shame at the door. It ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, you're in the Father's house. Hallelujah. And while Jeff's coming up here, I want you guys to take that. I want you to let that seep. When I think about singing that chorus, lay your burdens down. You've heard that before. But it says, lay your burdens down when you're with the Father, when you're standing with Him in His house with you. There He is. Check your shame at the door because it's not welcome. Your shame is not from God. Conviction, let's give a thumbs up. Shame, thumbs down. Shame is not of God, and we are not to walk with it because we are in our Father's house, walking in our Father's love. Amen? Good morning. We're in the Father's house today, aren't we? It's a great day in the house of God. It's a great day to be here at Legacy Church. We're so thankful you're here with us in person or if you're seeing us online right now. We're so excited that you're here. If it's your first time here, we're, we're especially, especially, that's a new word, welcome that you are here today. And we welcome you here and just uh, to be a part. If you have any questions or anything about Legacy Church, you can always find out everything you need to know about us at LegacyChurchGA.com. Or if you look behind me right now, there would be a QR code that you can scan with your phone. Or if you're online, you can scan it as well. And that way it will give you all the information, all the, the way we can reach contact with you, the way we can connect with you. It's just a way to get to know about who you are as well. So we're thankful that you're here today. One of the biggest things that we're hap that's happening in the life of our church here in the next couple weeks is a dual campus worship. And we're going to have that here at, at the Canton, here at the Bluffs in Canton. And that will be March 27th at 10 a.m. Both campuses, our Legacy Marietta campus and our Legacy Canton campus here will be together. And we'll be having a brunch afterwards or brunch with that as well. And also it's our annual business meeting. So stick around for that as well. It's how we, we let you know kind of in person of everything that's going on in Legacy Church and what we're looking forward to in the next year. Because God's got some great things, right? Our church is moving forward. We don't move backwards in the church. We move forward. And when we move forward, that's, that's one of the best things we could do. And right now, I'm going to ask all the kids, all the kids fifth grade and younger, if they would stand up and move forward out the door to Children's Church. So if you're fifth grade and younger, just move on forward out there and you'll have, some, have a great time today. We're thankful that everything that's going to happen today out there in Children's Church. And then everyone up here, let's pray today. Let's pray about not only just uh, what God's doing in this room, but for everyone else and everything that's going on in our world, everything in our lives, because we know that the Father's house is here, but His grace and mercies extend way beyond where we're at. He's everywhere. Father God, bless us today. Help us during this time of worship, or this time of service, Father God. Lord, bless the words. Help them to fall on our hearts, and Lord, resonate the message today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I know it doesn't feel like it, but I, I think I saw yesterday where uh, spring is officially like 10 days away. Uh, maybe somebody can verify that. Uh, but today it certainly doesn't feel like it. But in, in, the, in any case, with the arrival of spring, you know, some of us have the, the green thumbs, not me, but maybe some of you uh, like to get out in the yard and begin planting spring, you know, flowers. And it's just sort of like, you know, it, it's, it's the arrival of hope. You know, I feel like spring is like winter's gone. You know, our suffering 
ends, our long suffering ends, and spring means, you know, hope is now here. Now, uh, if you're a green thumb, raise your hand, I'm curious. Okay, could you come to my house? Uh, next week would be great, and, uh, and plant some flowers, that would be, I'd really appreciate it, thank you. Uh, you just volunteered yourself, so you shouldn't have raised your hand. You should always be, you always wait until, you know, the person finishes the sentence before you raise your hand, then you don't, you don't have to commit to it, okay? Just a little tip for you. Uh, when we lived in Illinois, our house, uh, the previous owners had done a lot of work in the yard uh, when it comes to flowers, and uh, that was great because we, we don't have green thumbs, and we could get all the credit, but there was this one flower uh, the iris that would bloom, and it was, you know, spectacular. And I'd never seen an iris, you know, up close, never had one. Uh, but, you know, they bloomed, and it was like purple and yellow, and it was just this beautiful, right in front of our door, you know, it's this great, you know, colorful flower. And then about a week later, they were dead. <laughs> and so, uh, and every year we were there for four years, you know, the iris would bloom, and it'd be fully bloomed for like a week, and then it would die. And then the rest of the summer, it's just like falling over, you know, like, like a bunch of weeds. But it was great while it lasted, okay? Uh, but there is there's something to be said about growth. And we are in the second week of a two-week sort of a mini-series, I'm calling it, of uh, the words of Jesus. Jesus in his own words, the great... I am. And uh, last week we talked about Jesus as the way maker. You know, that uh, this, while, while it sounds very exclusive, Jesus' claim to be the way, the truth, and the life, the only way to eternal life with God is actually very inclusive. And his invitation is, is for every single person uh, on the face of the earth to come to him to receive that grace and mercy. And today we're talking about Jesus as the sustainer. Now, when we say Jesus as the sustainer, we mean that he's not only, you know, our savior, he's not only, you know, rescued us from the, the consequences of brokenness and the, the realities of this life that involves brokenness and sin and, and this fractured relationship that we have with God apart from Jesus, but he is also the sustainer, meaning that he, he provides a way for us to endure life and to grow in our relationship with him. Because a relationship with Jesus is not just a one-time deal. You know, it's not just a, hey, I had this experience, you know, at this maybe revival service or in college. Or I went to this church service one time and, and I, I received Jesus. It is, it is now a growth in Jesus. That, that he is not just our Savior, but he's also our Lord. Meaning that he governs and rules and reigns over every area of our life. And today I want to look at a, a passage in John uh, chapter 15. If you want to turn with me there or on your phone or in your Bibles, it will be on the screen. You know, the text that uh, Cricket read just a moment ago is our text and teaching for today. And, and Jesus is spending his last hours with his disciples. You know, before he would go to the cross and he's spending this time with them and he's sort of preparing them for the reality of what's going to happen after he leaves. And uh, in, in the entirety of John 13 to John 20 is about 12 hours. So it is, it is right before Jesus would go to the cross. And, and he's sort of gathering with them in the upper room and, and giving them really what they needed to not only survive but to thrive. And, and, and he says in John 15 that I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. Now when Jesus says I am the true vine, it's this sort of reference back to the Old Testament that, that all throughout the Old Testament, God's people were known as the vine. The, the covenant people of God, God's chosen people were known as the vine. And, and sort of, you know, the relationship between God's people and God in the Old Testament is sort of this cycle of, of 
you know, closeness and then drifting and closeness and drifting. And God would sort of call them back to himself through prophets and judges and people that came to warn and correct and sort of bring God's people back into this harmony with God. And then they would just sort of forget about that and go off on their own. I know none of us can relate to that, but just try to work with me here that, that they would drift away from God and, and his plan for their life. And, and so that, with that in mind, Jesus comes along with that sort of in the back of their minds and says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. In the temple in Jerusalem, uh, at the entrance of the temple, there was this uh, golden vine you know, that, that uh, you would see as you're entering the temple. And it's just sort of this image that, that entering into a relationship with God that, that in the Old Testament, the temple was the place in which God dwelled. And, and with that in the mind, Jesus comes into that and says, now I am the true vine. That I am now the, the way to have a relationship with God. I am the, the vehicle through which you will now have a relationship with God. Verse 2, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. There's this reality, okay, this is kind of the gardening portion of the teaching. There's this reality that apart from the, the vine, the branches are dead. That when the, the branches are connected to the vine, that is when they produce the most fruit. And, and conversely, when they are not connected to the vine, that is when the branches are lifeless and even useless. In, in reading about the, you know, because much to your surprise, I don't have a, I'm not a gardener. I don't have a vine with grapes on it. But I discovered that actually the pruning process is, is most, it takes up most of the process in producing grapes. And actually, there's a lot of pruning that has to take place before there's any growth of the vine, before there's any fruit, you could say, before any grapes appear. In reading about this, that, that you know, the experts say that it can take several years of pruning before there's any fruit. I thought that was really interesting. And it's this reality that, you know, a lot of times in our walk with Jesus, we expect instant fruit, don't we? Instant results. I mean, it's the pop it in the microwave, eat on the go sort of culture that we get sucked into. And when it comes to our spiritual life and vitality, we want to see fruit right away, don't we? And that job we've been praying for and praying about, we want to see instant results. We want to see instant fruit. That relationship we're praying about, instant fruit, instant results. But have we ever thought about this truth that sometimes God wants to take us through a pruning process before there's any fruit? Well, we don't like to talk about that, though. I mean, that's like the, the part that, that really is, is not appealing it's not attractive I mean who wants to go through the pruning process it's like it's no fun for us right we want to get to the fun part we want to get to the results part the fruit parts but sometimes God wants to take us through the pruning before we can experience his power and I've experienced that pruning you know the, the pruning comes when we're sort of drifting from God and God sends people into our life to bring us back into alignment with him. To say, hey man, like, I love you, but I'm really concerned about that. That's God's way of pruning. You ever had someone come to you and say, hey, like, you know, I just want you to know, like, as your friend, that I think this is, this is not good for you. In love, this is not good for you. That's pruning. Let's see, we resist that though, don't we? 
We resist the pruning because we want to just get to the fruit. We want to get to the results. We want to get to the end. But God is saying, no, it's not about the end. It's about the process to get there. That fruit bearing is the result of life-giving attachment to the vine. And that life-giving attachment only comes through the pruning. As Jesus says, he cuts off every branch that bears no fruit. But the branches that bear fruit, he, he makes them even more fruitful. Have you ever thought that the, the, the low point, that the valley, that the discipline that God takes us through is actually the avenue to bearing more fruit? You are already clean because the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me so as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. See, ab abiding or remaining in Jesus is when God makes his home in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. That, that's what happens when God comes to, to reside in us, when his spirit lives in us. That is what Jesus is talking about, remain in me or abide in me as I also remain in you. It's this mutual remaining that happens, that Jesus is remaining in us as we remain in him. And no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. See, we try to bear fruit apart from the vine. We try to produce fruit apart from the vine. But the reality is that nothing can happen apart from the vine. That our spiritual vitality is not of our own effort. It is not of our own gifting. It is through our attachment to Jesus. And to be a follower of Jesus means that we are completely dependent on him as the vine. You see, here's the deal. That Jesus says, hey, you, you are already what you're trying to be. You're already what, what you're trying to be. That you're trying to bear fruit apart from me. You're trying to... To produce apart from me. And Jesus says, no, no, no. You already are clean because of my word. Because of my presence and my very life that lives in you. You are already what you're desperately trying to be. See, Jesus is the true vine. But the false vines are what make us lifeless, what suck the life out of us, what the false vines will actually kill the branches. And the false vines that appear as though there's life and vitality in them are actually killing us. What are the false vines? There's religion. Well, how can religion be a false vine? It's because religion says that you have to do these things in order to be accepted by God. And and if you do these things and don't do these things, then you're, you're in, right? And no one wants to be left out. You want to be in. And religion says to be in, you have to do this. And the focus of religion is on you and me. See, that's the difference. Whereas Jesus, as the true vine, says, no, no, the focus is not on you. The focus is on me. I am the vine. And I am what gives you life. There's also status. Status is a false vine. Because status has this appearance as though it's life-giving. And if we could just have this or live in this neighborhood or drive this car or be you know, in this group of people, then, then that is what will give us life and it sucks life out of us. Because we're constantly trying to be what we cannot be. We're constantly trying to manufacture energy to, to be this sort of person that we, that we envision. And it's always a false vine because it always brings us to a place where we just spend and exhaust ourselves on trying to be that kind of person. <clears throat> Family is also a false vine. What do, what do you mean? What do you mean family is a false vine? Sometimes that we put all of our, 
all of our hopes and dreams in our family. We think our spouse is, the, is like, you know, we put all of our hopes and dreams in that person. And we sort of have this vision of what life is going to be with them, and right? And then and they are sort of the key to get there. And, and then we realize, well, no, wait, wait a minute. That, that person has flaws. That person has is broken. And, and when that person can't sort of lead us to that vision of our life, to that dream that we have, then we sort of, what, what, do, we, what do we say? Well, well, there must be something wrong with them. There must be something wrong with them. I mean, here's this picture. Uh, like, this is how I envision my life being in this family. And this person's not really bringing me to that. This person has flaws. Now, this hasn't happened in our marriage, but other marriages, you know, that have flaws where one of the, one of the people is, you know, just try to think with me for a minute. Hypothetically, you cannot put your hopes and dreams in your spouse because they will disappoint you every single time. And hey, you can't put your hopes and dreams in your kids either. There, it is very possible to worship your kids as an idol. I love my kids. I love my two boys. I love them more than anything else in the world. I would give up anything for them, and I know you would too. But sometimes there's a temptation to make put them on a pedestal and worship them. Like, look, your kid is not going to be the next Michael Jordan, okay? Just, I just want to tell you that. He's, he's not going to be the next LeBron James. He's not going to be the next, you know, Tom Brady, okay? He can't even throw the football three yards. I mean, just... Let's just look at the facts here, okay? Wealth can be a false vine, right? Wealth, the accumulation of wealth can be a false vine. The love of money is the root of all evil. It doesn't say money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money. We talked about this last series in Kingdom Economics that God has given us what he's given us to be a blessing to others, not to terminate on our own happiness, our own satisfaction. But Jesus says, verse 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. And reading about this, Commentaries were saying that, I mean, there's literally no other use for a branch that is not connected to the vine. They could not even use it for any other purpose other than just throwing it away. That the wood, if the wood was disconnected, there was nothing else they could do with it. That it was useless at that point. And so life is not about being attached to vines that kill us. Life is about being attached to Jesus as the true vine. Jesus says, abide in me. And so our remaining in Jesus is what gives us life. See, being attached to a false vine puts the focus on us where we have to constantly produce, we have to constantly measure up to this standard that we can, hey, newsflash, we can't measure up to. But when we abide in Jesus, the pressure to perform, the pressure to be the kind of person we think we have to be is released. And abiding in Jesus is the only thing that gives life. See, Abiding in him is this experiential sort of relationship with him. It's, it's vitality. It's experiencing God's presence and power in our life. That's what abiding in Jesus 
means. That's what it looks like. It, is it knowing all the right things about God? Is it only that? No, I mean, that's important. Right, right believing is important. Is it living an ethical life? Is it only that? No, it's not only that. Ethics are important. But abiding in Jesus about, is about having this experiential power in our life. And I wonder if, if we've sort of skipped over that or missed that in our walk with him. That, that it is not only about believing the right things. It's not about doing the right things. It's about experiencing Jesus, abiding in him. And th this is actually what, what people who are far from God or, or not yet followers of Jesus want to see. They want to see that this is real to us and that it makes a difference in our life. Because they don't first come and say, well, what do you believe about this doctrine or this, this what's your position on this thing? They don't, they want to know the answer to two questions. Okay? Does your life reflect what you say you believe? Number one. Does your life reflect what you say you believe? And number two, is it real and transformative? Or is it just something you do out of habit? Or because you have to? Or because someone's elbowing you that you better show up with me? Does our life reflect what we say we believe? That's what the watching world looks at. That's what the watching world looks at. Is it real and transformative? Has it made a difference? Has it made a difference? And if the answer is no to those two questions, then I think we have reach the point where we might be acknowledging Jesus but not abiding in him. See, there's a difference between acknowledging and abiding. Acknowledging is when Jesus is real. We might say, well, yeah, I acknowledge that Jesus was a, a historical person. Like he's a, you know, he actually lived a real person in history, but it doesn't really impact my life. Acknowledging is when Jesus, and maybe what even, even what Jesus says is beneficial and good, you know, hey, like, you know, love one another. I mean, that's a good principle, right? No one's going to disagree with that when Jesus says love each other and, you know, like take care of the poor. I mean, that's a good idea too. I mean, we should really do that. No one's disagreeing with what Jesus says about those things. It's beneficial even, but we don't totally depend on him for life. That's acknowledging Abiding is when we cannot live without him. Abiding is when he isn't just Savior, he's also Lord, where my life is guided by him. You see the difference here? I, I fear that sometimes we do a lot of acknowledging and not abiding. And so I want to talk about two things. James is not abiding right now, he's just... I want to talk about two things. You know, a sound of a crying baby is a sign of a healthy church. I told somebody that last week. And listen, if you bring a baby in here, I don't, it's, oh, are they going to cry? Like, we have nursery and all that. One of you, you know, that's there for you. Uh, but if the baby cries, that's a sign of a healthy church. Okay? We want sound of crying babies here. Um, amen. Thank you. Yeah. You see, that's, that's agreeing with me. It's agreeing with me. Two things that we were to abide, abide in. One is his, his words. His words. He says in verse 7, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. When Jesus says, if you remain in my words, remaining in Jesus, his presence in our life and his words are the same thing. 
that his indwelling presence in our life it are his words. The words here, this word is plural, words, are referring to Jesus' individual words, the collection of those that make up his teaching. So basically the, the sum of all that Jesus says remaining in us, his words. And Jesus says that, that love for him is not marked by desire but obedience. Meaning that desire is good and it is important and desire to grow in our relationship with God is certainly, certainly a part of it. It's key. But desire alone does not result in abiding. It's not abiding. It's, it's obedience. See that acknowledging has desire, it's like I, I desire to move forward in my life. And yes, I, I want every person to have that desire. But Jesus says, desire is not going to get us there. It's obedience. And obedience, here's the thing about obedience. It doesn't come on our own will and determination. Because I don't know about you, but those, that whole Ten Commandments thing hasn't really worked out for us in human history. And, and thus, you know, the, the commands presented the need for someone to follow the commands, hence Jesus. And so it hasn't really worked out where we've been able to keep the commandments. In case, I mean, you can try. You can leave here and go and try to keep the commandments. And then, you know, come back next week and let me know how that works. I mean, I don't think any of you, hopefully, will go, go out and kill someone. You know, do not murder or even steal. Please don't do that. But, but you might look at your neighbor and go, man, I wish we had that. Or a coworker and, and no, I, I, covet, coveting is, what, what I'm trying to say is that Jesus' words are meant for, for our obedience. But, but here's the thing. I don't want you to leave here and go, oh, I just, I, I don't feel like I can do what Jesus says to do. Not feeling like we can do what Jesus says to do is not our out. You with me? It's, it's not our kind of like, well, I just, I'm just going to, I mean, I tried that whole thing with Jesus, and it's just too much. It's too hard. I mean, he's, I can't love my neighbor. I mean, he's a jerk. Have you met him? He's just like, you know, he doesn't cut his grass, and, you know, I called the HOA 10 times, and they won't do anything. And then, you know, the, t the teachers at my kid's school or whatever, like, it, this thing is too hard to do. Like, that is not our out, but that is our trigger for more dependence on Jesus. Like, the reality and the fact that we can't do what Jesus says to do on our own power should lead us to more dependence on him. And so instead of withdrawing, we actually lean in more. We say, I can't do this. I can't do this on my own power. I can't do this on my own power, but I know that I can do this with Jesus' help. With his help, his words, John 8, 31, Jesus says, if you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples. And by the way, I, I think talking about pruning, we're going through a pruning. We're going through a pruning. The church, not just this church, but the church globally is going through a pruning. I believe God is taking us through a pruning season where he's cutting away the things that bring us comfort, the convenience of following Jesus. It should never be convenient. By the way, I hope we make it inconvenient. Like, because we've spent the last 20 years, we being the church globally, has spent the last 20, uh, the North American church, the global church is actually leading the way. The North American church is lagging behind because we've spent the last 20 years making it convenient. And how did that work out? And now that the conveniences are stripped away, God is taking us through a pruning. But we should invite that pruning and not 
push against it because it's that pruning that's going to lead to more growth. His words in the, the second way that we abide in him is his love. John knew that we would forget about love. And so he mentions the word almost 40 times in the gospel. More than double, the word love appears in the gospel of John more than double the other gospels. And John is like, okay, I've, I'm, I'm the last gospel. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they, they didn't get it. I'm going to make sure that you get it. I'm going to mention love 40 times. Love is the fruit of the vine. You say, well, what's the fruit? It's love. And it's as, it's as though John knew that we would forget. And so he's throwing this in here. He's like, okay, you know, verse 9, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. The same kind of love that you and I have and are to exhibit in our life is the love that Jesus experiences with the Father. <laughs> and the love that Jesus experiences with the Father is a sacrificial love. It's a love that goes the extra mile. It's a love that loves no matter what. It's a love that is based on covenant and promise, not a contract. It's a love that says, I will love you no matter the circumstances, no matter what you do, no matter if you love me in return. I mean, in case you haven't heard something that you felt like was too hard to do without Jesus' help, that's one. The kind of love that Jesus says to love with is the kind of love that he loved us and loves us with. That's a love that keeps no record. That's a love that doesn't pull out the old files of what you did years ago. Remember that? I mean, you're, you're, you're a terrible person. Remember what? No, no, no. Love has a short memory when it comes to those things. Love is the fruit. So here's a math equation, you know, for anyone who loves math. There's an there's a equation here that the source and the fruit result in joy. What's the source? What is the purpose of my life? It's to be attached to Jesus, not the false vines, not family, not religion, not wealth, not status. Those are false vines. They will actually kill. But the true vine, the source, is Jesus. And when I'm connected to Jesus... I have fruit. Now, fruit is not the evidence. That's what religion says. Religion says, no, 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 you got to do these things. That's the evidence. No, no, fruit is not the evidence of our relationship with Jesus. It's the byproduct of being attached to the vine, of being connected to him. If there is fruit, it's because we're connected to Jesus. It is a life-giving relationship with him that produces joy. Joy. Verse 11, I have told you this so that my joy may be, may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Joy. You know you have joy when you can look at your circumstances, no matter what they are, and still look to Jesus no matter what the circumstances are. That's joy. Joy is not based on circumstances, it's based on truth, that we're connected to him. Andrew Murray says, and listen, I, there, if, if you're sitting here listening to this and you're going, I, I, I just don't feel like I have a life-giving relationship. That thing you're talking about, that it's experiential, Mitchell, like, like I, I don't feel like I'm there. I'm not feeling that. I want you to listen to this. Andrew Murray said, if there is in your heart the consciousness that you are not a strong, healthy, fruit-bearing branch, not closely linked with Jesus, not living in him as you should be, then listen to him say, I am the vine. I will receive you. 
I will draw you to myself. I will bless you. I will strengthen you. I will fill you with my spirit. I, the vine, have taken you to be my branches. I have given myself utterly to you. Children, give yourselves utterly to me. I have surrendered myself as God absolutely to you. I became man and died for you that I might be entirely yours. Come and surrender yourselves entirely to be mine. The experience of a life-giving relationship with Jesus, of being connected to the vine, only comes when we surrender and receive it. And that brings freedom and that brings life. And that brings joy. If you are overwhelmed with the pressure of trying to perform and be the kind of person you think you should be, hear these words. I am the vine. I will receive you. I will draw you to myself. I will bless you. I will strengthen you. I will fill you with my spirit. Will you pray with me? Father, we ask that you would come and fill us with your spirit. Father, we confess that we spend our energy on the false vines, religion, status, family, wealth. God, bring us back today to Jesus as the true vine, life-giving vine, filling us with his presence and his power for life and living. God, bring us back so that we might have true joy, true joy found in him, that we might receive him as the vine today. We ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. Just a moment, we're gonna take communion as one uh, church body. And communion is really a perfect picture of remaining connected to the vine. That when we take that cup and that uh, loaf of bread, representing Jesus' body and blood broken for us, is poured out for us, it is this reminder that we are connected to him. And so I want to invite you, uh, the team's going to begin to worship. And as they begin to play, when it, whenever you're ready, there's two trays, one on each side. that You can make your way to the front and take that cup. And I just want to invite us to be reminded that we are connected to Jesus. We already are what we're trying to be. So let's dwell in that truth today and have hearts of gratitude as a result. Let's take communion together.
we leave today, uh, we have a word uh, from one of our mission partners, uh, Eric and Randy Lynn Johnson. Randy Lynn grew up at Legacy, and uh, they are with Youth with the Mission in Colorado Springs, and I want you to hear from them, so let's check that out. Hi, Legacy family. It is great to be with you this morning. Uh, and as we are in this season of Lent, looking more extensively at the life of Jesus, we are reminded of the privilege that it is to carry his message of love and hope into the nations. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, we are Eric and Randy Lynn Johnson, and we are missionaries at Youth with a Mission in Colorado Springs, uh, and we've been here since 2011. Yeah. Years. The purpose of our campus is to cultivate revival and transformation amongst the least reached people of the world. You might ask, who are the least reached? There's an area of the world, North Africa, Middle East, and into Asia, where there are 3.1 billion people who have little to no access to the gospel. And if you ask me, that's one of the greatest tragedies in the world right now. So our campus focuses on training and sending and sustaining missionaries to this area of the world so that we can make Jesus known amongst the nations. Now, last year alone, we sent 240 students into the nations. Uh, we helped send and sustain about 103 full-time missionaries in that area of the world in about 25 different countries. Um, and you might want to know, here's a little fun fact for you. The fastest, the two fastest growing churches in the world are in Iran and Afghanistan, two countries that we pray into and send people to. And we are so excited about that. Yep. And we're getting ready to launch out two teams, one to Northern Iraq and one to Kyrgyzstan. So you guys can be praying for them as they get ready to go. Um, and as always, we just want to say a huge thank you to all of you who pray for us, support us financially. Um, it really makes all the difference in the world as we are in this together to see God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. As we work together to fulfill the Great Commission, know that we love you and we are praying for you. Happy Lent. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's a great reminder that God has called us to go uh, to the nations. And uh, so I want to thank you in advance for... box and it is located just outside those doors you can drop it in as you leave and thank you thank you in advance for your generosity because it